Welcome everyone to uh, this great webinar that we have in store for you today. This is the second webinar in our series to commemorate 2023 as the International Year of Millets. I'm Lauren Barreto, Chief of Staff at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and it's an honor for us to host this event and for me to be your moderator today. Today, we're going to learn about the environmental benefits of millets, and we're going to learn some tasty recipes that we can all make at home uh, with Fonio. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Rebi Harawa, Country Representative for Kenya and Regional Director for Eastern and Southern Africa at the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, uh, which most of you know as ICRASAT. She's an agricultural research and development expert with extensive experience across Africa and previously held the position of head of the Soil Fertility and Fertilizer Systems Program for the Alliance for a Green Revolution for Africa. Yeah, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and share uh, on this very important topic about uh, millets. Uh, as you have rightly put it, uh, Ikrisat. Uh, we are one of the institutions that is uh, working on crops such as millets because our work focuses on building resilience and transforming food systems of dry land uh, agroecologies. So I really looking forward to a uh, very interesting and interactive discussion. Next slide. Uh, just by way of uh, introduction, I don't know how many people know about ICRISAT, the International Crop Research Institute for Semi-Arid Tropics. Uh, we are an institution that has been in existence for uh, 50 years. Our vision is to have a, a prosperous, food secure and resilient dry land. And uh, we work in Asia as well as Africa. Our mission is to reduce poverty, hunger, malnutrition, and environmental degradation in these dry land tropics. Uh, you can see on the map uh, in terms of our locations. Uh, as I said, we are in Asia and Africa, and where you see the green uh, sheds is where we have our physical locations. Otherwise, in terms of uh, our work, we cover a land of 6.5 million square kilometers in 55 countries. Uh, we have three programmatic areas. Uh, the first one is accelerated crop improvement, uh, which focuses on the delivery or development of technologies, uh, particularly the improvement of uh, crop varieties uh, through our work uh, in uh, collection of, uh, you know, a number of uh, these crops. Uh, we have, uh, we are one of the largest gene banks for uh, crops like millets. Uh, we also have a second program, which is on res resilient farm and food systems. Uh, this focuses on, uh, again, bringing technologies that complement the crop varieties. For example, uh, we develop technologies to improve water and uh, uh, soil health. Uh, the third component of our programmatic areas is the enabling systems transformation. And this is where we are actually uh, bringing uh, the scaling of uh, the water and the uh, crop technologies that I said. So we deal with issues of uh, improving the value chains uh, to make sure that uh, they are sustainable, but also working uh, you know, around uh, digital agriculture and uh, cross-cutting themes like uh, inclusivity, uh, bringing women as well as youth uh, to be part and parcel of for this uh, effort of transforming uh, agriculture. Next. As I said, we specialize in crops that are adaptable for the dry lands. And uh, on this one, we have uh, cereals, uh, millet sorghum, and uh, grain legumes. And uh, these crops are really good for you because they are really nutrient dense. Uh, they are also uh, they are adaptable to uh, climate change, uh, particularly drought. Uh, as I said, we work in these dry, uh, dry land agroecologies and uh, these crops are very adaptable even during drought conditions but they are also resilient uh, in terms of uh, their ability to uh, actually be able to grow and be able to produce uh, even in this harsh uh, climate condition, but also low nutrient content. 
As I mentioned that uh, these crops have high nutrient dense and uh, for the sake of this uh, uh, conversation we are having today, I'm going to highlight uh, the sorghum and uh, millets, uh, peel millets and finger millets. Uh, these are very uh, common here in Africa. Uh, I think uh, even in the previous web seminar, uh, we know that these have low glycemic index, which is very important for managing non-communicable diseases, for example, diabetes, but they also provide daily requirements for iron and zinc. And iron and zinc is very critical, particularly for the growing of children, but also uh, women who are uh, pregnant women. And uh, it's very important that uh, these crops are actually uh, are part of the diets uh, for our growing population. Of course, high fiber content, uh, antioxidants, gluten-free. Uh, just to highlight that the finger millet, for example, it has three times calcium than milk. I think this is sometimes the information that people don't know because we always have this notion that, uh, you know, cow milk has more calcium. But uh, I think we need to know that the finger millet has three times more calcium than the milk. And of course, when you compare with maize, which is the step of most of the countries, particularly in East and Southern Africa, uh, we find that finger millet is actually contains 30 times calcium than maize. And of course, this is an affordable protein. Next. So why are really millet becoming important? Uh, I think there is a lot of uh, increased awareness on the health contributions of these millets. As I said, most of the lifestyle diseases today, like diabetes, hypertension, you can easily avoid them by having these healthy diets. I think in most of our you know, areas, as I mentioned, Eastern Southern Africa, we are eating too much of the maize, which is for me, I call it an empty calorie. Yes, you get the energy, but it's an empty calorie because you don't have the nutrition and you have, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, we, we talked about the glycemic index. This one has low high glycemic index. And therefore that awareness that we are seeing, particularly in the middle class, I think it's now making these millets become an important crop uh, in our diets. Uh, they are, of course, as I said, resilient to climate change, drought tolerant, uh, but they also have greater, uh, you know, use efficient, water use efficiency compared to maize, for example, 35%, but also they thrive in very limited use of nutrient. They can grow in poor soils. In fact, uh, at ICRISAT, we recommend what we call uh, fertilizer microdosing. Uh, fertilizer microdosing is where you add uh, just a third of most of the recommended fertilizer, just using a bottle top, and you can be able to uh, get the optimum yields uh, for the varieties. Uh, they also have diverse use, not just for food, but you can use them as livestock. And this is very important, particularly in the dry land areas where we have agro pastoral system. So you can actually use them for livestock. And of course, it's also part of the marting and this is part of the industrial uses. At ICRISAT, we have uh, developed a number of varieties. You can see for sorghum, we have uh, over 200 uh, improved varieties, uh, 100, over 100 uh, uh, finger millet, uh, peel millet varieties and 30 finger millet varieties. And uh, these varieties are bred, uh, not just for the adaptation to the dry land agroecologies, but also responding to consumer uh, and also the uh, market demands. Next. We see a lot of opportunities with uh, sorghum and millets. And uh, for uh, Africa, we are seeing that uh, a number of the programs uh, that have been introduced in schools, the school feeding programs, uh, these uh, type of crops, millets, as I said, they are very important to our growing population, the, youth, the, the young people. So the school feeding program, I think uh, most of the school feeding programs are now adopting these crops, but they're also very important uh, when it comes to the making of confectionaries uh, from cookies, uh, from uh, breakfast cereals, 
And uh, in East Africa, it's commonly found in uh, foods like uh, chapati, but also we make what we call ugali, which is the major staple for East Africa and Southern Africa, and also even in Western Central Africa. And uh, at ICRISAT, we have produced cook, uh, what we call cookbooks or recipes for actually you know, communities to start adapting this to all kinds of things that they're used to. And these are, uh, you know, cookbooks or recipes that have been developed with communities uh, where they actually, you know, try all kinds of recipes in order to make sure that they like the taste, they like the color. And I have to mention that uh, you can also easily blend the flour of sorghum and millet. You can blend it with cassava flour. You can blend it with wheat. You can blend it with maize. And I think that's uh, the most important part that this is also becoming a key area where policymakers now, they see this as an opportunity to actually reduce the imports uh, on wheat because most of the countries in Africa, they're actually importing wheat, but you can be able to make bread, for example, by blending with sorghum and millets and reduce uh, their import bills on wheat. As I said, it's also very important. These crops are very important for uh, livestock. And of course, in the value chain, we see that you get a number of players uh, from the production, uh, from the, you know, uh, the, 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 the threshing during the harvest, but also the value addition. So actually the value addition that can actually, you know, even bring employment to the youth, particularly in the rural areas. Next slide. I want to highlight, uh, you know, some of the varieties, as I said, these several varieties have been bred, but I want to highlight this Jakiti variety. Uh, Chakit variety is uh, a variety that is very high in iron. You can see 60 parts per million, but it's also early maturing. Literally in uh, two months, you can be able to harvest. This variety was released in 2018 uh, in, our, in, in Africa. And you can see that it's one of the really answer to the problem that we have in uh, you know, uh, an, an, an anemia. Uh, we have a huge population that uh, is anemic, and this becomes the answer to combat this anemia. Uh, I want to highlight that uh, when this variety was released in 2018, we quickly saw the uptake because even during the participatory process, people tested it, and it's one of the testy you know, varieties. Uh, and it's a variety that you can even, you know, not just eat it like for breakfast, but you can even make dessert out of that. It's a very fantastic, and I want to tell people to say if you are in West Africa, if you're in Pedro, any part of the Africa, you need to try this jacket variety. Uh, the, the other important things to mention is that uh, I think one of the things that ICRISAT is doing with the national partners is to make sure that seed is available. And you can see that even within the shortest period of time, uh, we actually, you know, uh, delivered seed in partnership with public-private uh, partnership, for example, 15 tons in Niger. And we saw also an expansion of this like to 1,200 hectares. This is in Senegal. Next. Uh, the next one I want to highlight is uh, sorghum, hybrid variety. This is the first time that hybrid variety was released in Zimbabwe. And uh, this is, uh, you know, it was released in uh, partnership with the private sector, and it's a white seeded variety. The reason why the white seeded variety is very important is because most of the people in this part of the world, when we are eating our what we call ugali or sadza in Zimbabwe or sima in Zambia, people are used to seeing it as as white. And now, when you have the brown, you know, uh, sima or brown ugali. Sometimes children, they don't like it. And some people, they don't like, they say, no, I want to see it white. And I'm glad to say that through the science, through the research, we are able to have this white variety, which now if they put the food on the table, they don't come and say, ooh, it's brown. Now they can have it, you know, in the white, that white color that they like. And of course it's early maturing, but also the yield, you're talking of eight tons, the potential of eight tons per hectare, which actually competes even with, uh, you know, comparatively when you look at the use that people get from maize. And most importantly, it's dual purpose. I think then my, my last slide, thank you. Yeah, so 
this is for me a good opportunity to have this conversation in this forum because as ICRISAT, we are actually you know, facilitating the uh, organization of uh, India-Africa International Minute Conference, which is going to be held in August from 30th to 31st. Again, the objectives to create awareness on these different millets. You can see in the photo that we have several varieties of these millets uh, loaded with the nutrients, adaptable to climate. And I think there is no better time really for the world to come together and really start promoting uh, these crops that are full, uh, that are loaded with the nutrients. And I hope that uh, we can be able to use even this platform to broadcast this message that please, you need to join us. It's going to be, you know, physical participation, but also there's going to be a platform for people to join virtually. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Harawa. What a great presentation. Uh, now we're going to hear from Chef TM, who's going to share some uh, exciting recipe that we can all cook at home with Bonio. Uh, just a little bit of a bio of Chef TM. He's a Senegalese-raised, New York City-based chef, author, restaurateur, social entrepreneur, and culinary ambassador. He's executive chef of NOC uh, in Lagos, Nigeria, where I have had the privilege of dining and had a lovely experience. He's also signature chef of the Pullman Hotel in Dakar, Senegal, and executive chef and co-owner of Taranga uh, right here in New York City, where I am based, uh, where I'm hoping to have my next meal. Uh, chef TM, over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm not sure if you can see me. I don't see myself, but I am going to assume that you are seeing me. Uh, thank you for this introduction. I truly enjoyed the ICRISAT presentation earlier, just confirming to me that it's very important that we break the silos and we have uh, conversations between the researchers. It should always begin with science, because and there's not enough research being done on these varieties of millet that grows in Africa. And that's unfortunate, because that makes us really dependent on our import. Africa is a net importer of food when we have so many interesting crops, food plant crops that could be uh, bringing solutions because they are resilient, like Dr. said earlier, they are resilient. I want to talk to you about a particular one today. It's a variety of millet called Fonio. As a uh, chef from Senegal, living in New York City early in my career, I just realized that you know there was not uh, um, enough of representation of African cuisine, West Africa in particular. And I wanted it to be the source of my inspiration. This is how I started really to that info inspiration in the tradition of our cuisine. And in that journey, and the starting a company called Yolele. Yolele is the brand that's bringing these crops, underutilized crops from Africa to a global platform. Ponyo is very important for all the reasons that doctor said earlier. It's a grain that's drought resistant, that grows in an area called the Sahel, as you can see on our map here in our branding. That red area is where Ponyo thrives. And there's not much that grows in there, and uh, which is very important to have a drought resistant crop these days that is also very nutritious, you know, with a uh, uh, rich in iron, rich in fibers, have amino acids that are deficient in most of the major grains. Ponyo has it in abundance. And the most important part is it cooks really easily. So you're gonna see today, I'm going to show you how to make two dishes of Ponyo. The Ponyo, plain Ponyo, first of all, it really is five minutes and less than that. You have to, you need boiling water. And I'm gonna fix my camera to the, um, to the stove so you can see what's going on here. This Looks is the great. water that's, thank you. Well, it's going to boil. I'm gonna raise my heat so that it boils. In the meantime, I'll tell you about the ingredients that are going in my first dish is called the Sponio and mango salad. I have lots of herbs in it. So it's herbaceous and fresh, it's like parsley. Mint. I'm going to put some mango because that's this time in Senegal, that's the mango season. I'll have some tomatoes. I'll have here some cherry tomatoes that are already cut up in diced. And I'll have a little bit of red onions and olive oil and some lemon. That's for the salad. It's inspired by the tabouleh, but with a tweak. Then I'll have a dessert with coconut milk, cocoa powder, and also some more mango for topping. So it's for new chocolate pudding and it's non dairy. So here, my water is coming to a boil. While it's not coming to a boil yet, I'm going to show you just how this variety of ponyo looks. It's like, a, it's a grain that's tiny, if you can see. I'm pouring it here so you can see. It's tiny, it looks like sand. So it's, it's 
easy to cook. It cooks in five minutes, like I said, but it's difficult to process because you have to remove the skin. And this is really way where innovation had to come. With my company, we decided to invest in the processing, but before that, we had to create a demand. So here, I'm going to pour the fonio here into the boiling water, as you can see. I just pour it, and I'll give it a quick stir with a spoon. And all I need to do now is reduce the heat to very low and keep it tightly covered, as if you're cooking rice, but it cooks much faster than rice. So let me just put the last grains here. All right, so you leave it covered here. And while it's covering, I'm, I'm going to bring a bowl to have all the other ingredients assembled in it. So my tomatoes, my chopped red onions a little bit, about one tablespoon. Half of my mango, that's gonna bring it that freshness and the sweetness. Because the thing about fonio is a grain that's so easy to use in so many different types of cuisine. That's why I'm doing this different one today, the salad, because it's summertime here, it's fresh. But you can also bring, use it as a porridge. You can use it as a side, just like a grain, any grain. It has a neutral taste, which makes it really easy to adapt with any type of sauce. And it likes to absorb the sauce. And when it's finished cooking, it looks fluffy like couscous. But it's not couscous, it's better than couscous. It's a whole grain. Couscous is actually a pasta that's been turned into flour from wheat. It's, this one is gluten-free, wheat is not gluten-free. So it's a great substitution for really any grain in your favorite recipes. It's very easy to adjust, to adapt. So in a few minutes, in a couple more minutes, the water is going to be absorbed and this fonio is ready to be eaten as a grain. Here, I'm just going to make it as a salad part of it. The other part, I'm gonna show you how to make the chocolate pudding with fonio. Again, um, this is a grain that you really want to consider integrating into your diet. Just like the chatki that uh, the doctor was talking about earlier that Iklisa developed, this one also grows in, uh, in two months. It's a fast growing grain. It's an ancient grain. It's been around for over 5,000 years. It's believed to be the oldest cultivated grain in Africa. But you know what, 5,000 years, it's resilient. We don't need to invent new resilient crops especially not a new variety of corn. This is, as doctor said earlier, this is so much more nutritious than corn, and it has the type of nutrition that we need to have for our own health, but for the health of our planet as well, because it's a climate-friendly crop. So, and not only it grows in three months, in two months, but it restores the topsoil. In the Sahel, that's very important because desertification is growing really fast. So a grain, because of its deep roots that nutrients nutrient to the soil and restores it. So that slows the advance of the desert. So it's really a way to mitigating the, the climate change effect. So again, I was showing you here, it's gone, it's ready. Look, look at this, it's within two minutes, three minutes, this is ready, see? The water has been absorbed and it's light and fluffy. Easy, easy. And you can be eat it, eating it like this. Mm. It's really nice, it has a slightly nutty flavor, but very neutral. But right now, I'm going to cool it off a little bit for my salad. I'll save a little bit for my salad here. Let it cool before I mix it with the rest. And while that's happening, I'm going to add some coconut milk here. to prepare my chocolate pudding. I'll add a little bit of vanilla extract. You can put whole, whole vanilla as well if you want. A few drops. I'll give it a stir. Sweeten it with honey, but you can use any sweetener of your liking. So if you don't want any sweetening too, you can just leave it as is. But honey is a perfect one to talk about today because uh, we're talking about sustainability and we know that our bees population is depleting as well. And we need to pay attention to that very closely because without bees, there's no agriculture for sure. Without bees, there's no cross pollination, there's no millet. And without millet, there's no future. Because those millets are actually 
this solution, those underutilized crops, especially the ones that grow in Africa, where I'm insisting on Africa because that's the the continent that has 60% of the world's arable land. So it's so important that we pay attention to that because the type of agriculture that we've been doing up to now, monoculture, the type of agriculture that's like abusing the water system, the type of agriculture that's adding chemicals to the soil in a way that's like destro destroying it is what we need to get away from. And this continent, Africa, that has 60% of the world's arable land is offering us the opportunity to rethink our agricultural system and come up with a more resilient type of agriculture that integrates the crops that are called underutilized or, or forgotten or often like the millets, all those varieties of millets need to be integrated. And we don't just integrate them as a commodity, which is very important. We need to really consider even the small farming communities that have been growing them. You know, those small farmers should be the ultimate beneficiaries. If we have a system that integrates them, we are really considering something that's just more than bringing a food solution to climate change. We're bringing a path to development in a sense. We're offering economic opportunities for those communities. They are among the poorest ones in the world. So while I'm saying that, you see my coconut milk is starting to come to a boil. It's time to add my cocoa, pure cocoa powder. And if you want to add just chocolate as well, that's fine. If your cocoa powder here, give it a stir. And while it's stirring, as soon as it dissolves, you can just add your cooked fonio. So the cooked fonio is going to cook deeper here to become a porridge. And that's the beautiful thing about fonio. It can be turned into a couscous-like kind of dish, or it can be turned into a porridge-like kind of dish. So you put enough cooked fonio and let it absorb. It's going to plump up a little longer into this and will give you this really lovely textured onion and chocolate pudding. And it's going to take only two, two minutes, two more minutes. And while this is happening, it's time to assemble my salad. I'm going to make sure all the steam is taken off. And I'll add a few spoonful of fonio to my ingredients. And I could make a dressing on the side. This is an option just because we have time limitation. I'm just gonna add some lemon juice in it to squeeze some lemon juice fresh from my garden here. And uh, a little more. I'll crack a little black pepper. Up to you how much I like to say to taste. First piece salt. Keep an eye here, the water is boiling. You want to reduce it a little bit. You need to be present when you're cooking. And then some olive oil. If you want to use other oil of your liking too, it's really up to you. But this is again the quick option if I don't put my uh, dressing in it. So you just got to squeeze a little bit of lemon juice and olive oil, salt and pepper. And I'll finish by adding my mint and my parsley. Which I stir. So you have the fragrance coming from the mint, herbaceousness from the parsley, sweetness from the mango, that crunchy red onion pepper, and then all that is balanced with the tomato, the salt, and the pepper. And you have a beautiful fonio salad here. And here, I'm gonna come back to my dessert. What do we have here? The pudding is happening. So really what's happened here, as you see, the fonio is absorbing it, and then, I'm just going to pour it here in my little bowl, dessert bowl, depending on how many you put, how many you're about to serve. This is a great thing about fonio, it goes a long way too. So 
So once you have it in your dissolved bowl, after allowing it to thicken a little bit, you, uh, let me put a little more. You can refrigerate it. You refrigerate it, it's going to thicken even and harden. And once it's refrigerated, you finish it by topping it with some fruits, the mango, the berries that we talked about earlier. And now you have a lovely, lovely chocolate pudding. And it's gonna just tease you a little bit by taking a spoonful of it, add some mango and some strawberries. The topping is up to you. And then, mm, this is wonderful. Sorry, I had to tease you, but see how simple it is to integrate a grain like this into your diet. And you have triple impact. Not only you have a delicious flavor to you that added to your level, to your your choice of, of menu every day, but you also have an impact on the planet. You have an impact on communities, small farming communities that's been growing it and that don't have access to market. And this is what we did with my company, Yolele. We wanted to create a market. So we really went from the fork to the farm. We created a demand, we created demand. It started with the US early on, Whole Foods took us. And within five years, we have a nationwide distribution, our mission to be to bring not only these grains for, for market, but also to teach about our food culture. So you have these different pillars that we have now in our products, you know, some jollof, all inspired by the traditional West African cuisine. We have a uh, dawa dawa, which is a fermented locust bean that also grows in the Sahel in a resilient way. We have one with moringa and baobab. So we 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 you going in that direction. It's very exciting to see that there is a demand for this, and now we need to have a support from the communities, from from the consumers, from organizations like ICRISAT, from the United Nations to keep this going. I mean, Fonio is limitless. I even wrote a whole cookbook dedicated to Fonio. And you have the whole journey here, if you're interested, the Fonio cookbook. And you see, you know, not only the farming communities that are growing it, you see interesting recipes, all, you know, dedicated to Fonio, around Fonio, but not only the traditional ones, imagined recipes. There's so much interesting thing that we could do with these grains and have a great nutrition and have a fun time in the kitchen and really support the whole um, system into becoming more resilient, a food system that urgently needs to be revisited, a food system that needs to have millet in it. Millet is like something that's been feeding us for thousands of years, that's nutritious, and we know it's going to come regardless of the, uh, the, the, the climate change, you know, it's going to come, so we need to support it. Anyway, so this is, uh, this is, this one, my, my, my next book is coming up too, by the way, sorry, I'm plugging it, it's coming in September, it's simply West African, and you will also have this type of recipes, easy to grow, easy to cook at home, all inspired by the tradition of West Africa, lots of millet recipes and, as well in it. So thank you again for your time. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I'm going to go ahead and have my breakfast here, so it's still morning here, and uh, if you have questions, I'll be around anyway. Thank you again. Thank you, Chef TM. It looks absolutely delicious. I think everyone on the line is very jealous. I know you've been cooking. You haven't seen the comments, but there have been several people saying, I'm going to try this at home. Oh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so hyped. Go for it. Um, really? Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I know we started a moment late uh, and we were supposed to be ending in just two minutes, uh, but since we started uh, a little bit late, I hope maybe I might put one or two questions to each of our panelists. Um, I'm going to sh start with one for Dr. Harawa. Bin Jaina, Bin Jaini is asking, um, who is producing the hybrid millet seeds that you were presenting? Is it like a private company? Is it a government agency? Is it a public-private partnership? And what are they doing to preserve um, traditional varieties while they're also promoting these new hybrid varieties? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you for that question. So um, we have... Uh, <clears throat> our what we call a public private partnership to produce hybrid. Uh, when we have open pollinated varieties, uh, uh, we work with, uh, for example, public and sometimes uh, farmer 
groups uh, because they are easy to you know, produce seed. But when it comes to hybrid, then we work with uh, private companies uh, together with uh, the public, the national system. So a number of uh, the you know, partnerships that we have, we actually formed what we call a hybrid parent uh, research consortium really to promote this hybrid. The good thing about hybrids is that they are really high yielding. And you can see that that soil gum variety, it's eight tons. I think something that I have to mention is one of the reason why maize came like, you know, in the early, nine, you know, in the 19th century and literally repressed crops like millets, which were growing, it was because of the quantity per unit land. So you have maize that can yield to five tons, and then you have these small grains that will yield two tons. That's what really pushed the policies to expand on maize. And therefore it's important that we have to be mindful that we still need to have the quantities because we have to feed a bigger population. For Africa, people are looking at 2 billion in 2050. And therefore we really need to be looking at the options of having these hybrids. How do we preserve the trace? As I said, that we have these gene banks where we have collected what we call wild varieties, some of the traditional varieties. And these are places where we are making sure that these traits, they don't get lost in the system. And of course, for farmers, they have choices to use either hybrid or the open pollinated varieties. And I think for me, what is very important is to make sure that we are balancing quality, but also the quantity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we have a question from the floor for Chef TM. Sunita Chandokar is asking about the fiber content of Fonio and the uh, GI, which I'm assuming is glycemic index. Um, I know we talked about that with some of the other varieties that Dr. Hararo presented, um, but if you could comment on that on Fonio. So the, the fiber content on Fonio depends on the, the level of processing. So UT, and that's interesting because uh, Dr. Doctor, doctor about it earlier, about how the, 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 the common pre preference for, for the Fonio is the white looking one that's been polished, which means the, the fiber is, is, has been uh, slightly removed from the brand so because of the extra polishing. But we are also coming with um, two packages of Fonio. One is a whole grain. So that's one has a much higher fiber content. And, and, and that's because the fiber is mostly in the skin part, which uh, uh, originally is removed. Uh, the exact numbers, I, can, I can't really uh, come up with it, you know, because I'm like, I have it written somewhere. But I'm sure doctor would be able to tell you also um, that uh, the glycemic index in Senegal, in the whole West African region, Doctors have been uh, for a while uh, recommending Fonio consumption because of that element of the low glycemic index. Again, the, the exact numbers, I don't want to adventure myself on it, but it's it compared to like the traditional rice that people tend to eat there. Uh, Fonio is highly recommended because of that. So yes, it's, um, um, those numbers are available. It can be um, uh, looked up. I mean, you can also Google it so I can uh, connect with you later on, but I can't give you exact numbers. I don't know, Dr. Harawa, if you want to add to that since um, or not, we can just move on to one more question. <laughs> yeah, I think we can move on. I think what is very important is that it's within the same range of uh, the millets, for example. Uh, if you compare with the other staples like maize and rice, obviously, the, you know these have low glycemic index uh, compared to mm -hmm. them. So I've, I don't have the figures for Fonio myself on my fingertips, but uh, definitely we need to recognize that I think it's the same, uh, you know, family of these millets. Yeah, it's the same family, and it's important that it it's also highlights the fact that we need to do so much more research. The amount of research done in those crops compared to the usual suspect, the, the mainstream crops, is it, just uh, astounding. You know, we been neglecting it. And then for different reasons, but we need to really invest in it and, and put more more, uh, more 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 science behind it. But uh, Fonio, for some reason, has been for the longest time re recommended for people suffering of diabetes type two in in West Africa. So because of its low glycemic um, aspect. 
Thank you so much. Uh, one more quick question, hopefully for each of you. Um, Dr. Harawa, Milan Mehta is asking about uh, the chalk tea, the white seed variety, I think it was that you presented. Um, is that consumed seasonally or is it something that's available all year round uh, they were asking about? It's available all year round. You know, you, you, you grow it and it's only two months, as I say. If you have an opportunity to have irrigated you know, crops during the year, you can definitely grow it. And you can, it's grain, you can store it, you can process it. Yeah, definitely, it's available. <laughs> Great. Uh, turning to a kind of similar uh, question for Chef TM, we do have a global audience. Uh, you know, everybody's saying that they're going to sign on to order their Fonio right now. Um, what countries are you shipping to? Where is it available? And you said that you're, you know, working to kind of globally increase the demand and consumption of um, millets and, and Fonio specifically. Uh, if it's not available somewhere, you know, right now, are there places that you're looking to for the future? Oh, it's available online, so uh, yolele.com, and obviously Amazon and uh, a few other, Fresh Direct, etc. In the U.S., it's available nationwide. We are distributing all the Whole Foods at Target, at Sprouts. All the major supermarkets are distributing our product. We even have Ponyo chips now in the, in the market, so we're innovating this way. But one, what we want, really wanted to do is have a global impact, and for that to happen, we needed to work on the innovation because Fonio, as I said earlier, is easy to grow. It really grows so easily, but it's difficult to process because you have to remove, you saw the side, it's a tiny little grain, you have to remove the germ, the, 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 the skin. And so because of that, there's close to 50% of post-harvest waste, which is high. And for, for us to, to really realize the dream of turning Fonio into a world-class crop, we had to work on that processing level. So what we did, we, we hired a, a milling equipment company to develop a processing for Fonio that's efficient. So, and we went from 50% of post-harvest waste to like single digits, which is amazing, almost doubling the production. Another element of the innovation was going from close to one ton per day of processing Fonio to two tons per hour. That's like the, that's really how we were able to not only doubling the production without growing more, but making it more efficient and having Fonio now accessible soon to the U. Uh, the U.S. is already here, but to Europe and of course West Africa, the the market in Africa. So we we have a structure in Mali and in Senegal, two structures: the mill that's processing the Fonio, contracting with small farming communities, a network that's growing. And then that mill is bringing the Fonio to the hub of distribution in Senegal that will be bringing Fonio to all the other all all markets in Africa and in, um, and in Europe and India. That's wonderful. And China. <laughs> That's just so great. Um, this has been such a wonderful session. It's been just so wonderful. Uh, you know, we've looked at the entire steps of the value chain from, you know, getting high quality seed to the farmers. Um, I love your entrepreneurship around the innovation for the processing. Um, you know, I think everyone will agree that what we've learned today is, you know, millet and fonio and sorghum and, uh, you know, the whole, all the millets, uh, the whole family is just such a great solution for returning value to um, smallholder farmers in Africa. And even the processing for me, I mean, it sounds like a challenge, um, but also an opportunity for, you know, local value addition and job creation, um, especially in Africa, where you have these young populations that are looking for jobs and, you know, really want to get engaged in um, an exciting sector that's doing great things. So thank you both for such wonderful presentations. I know I've learned so much. Uh, I can't wait to go home and, you know, order my Fonio and make my chocolate pudding. That sounded just absolutely delicious. Thank you so much for all the participants who joined online and your wonderful questions. Uh, and there is a link in the chat. I hope everyone will join us for our last session uh, in August, where we're focusing more on the nutritional aspects and nutritional benefits of um, millet. And we have one more uh, set of recipes from uh, one more chef. Thank you everyone so much again. Uh, I wish everybody a great rest of your day in whatever time zone you're in and uh, keep eating millet. Thank you. Bye. Now. Bye. Thank you.